All right, guys, welcome to the eighth and uh, penultimate session of uh, of the of this semester's reading group. So chapter eight uh, looks at making connections. So helping students kind of uh, see the connections between their lives and the material that they're looking at in class, the academic material to increase engagement, increase relevancy and retention and everything else. And so, Patrick, you're going to give us a quick synopsis of, of this chapter. I am. I am. OK, can you see that? You can indeed. Wonderful. Black and teal, my favorite. Yeah, making making connections. And I right off the bat, I, I picked up on this this notion of connected learning, which is which is a nice way. And I didn't realize there was a there was a lab doing research just on this particular uh, topic. But but it all kind of ties in and she she does a nice job of of walking us through this this activating prior learning, you know, which which is is kind of intuitive um, from from the get go. Uh, we 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 were not all shocked by the fact that you try to make the material uh, relevant for students to to get, get some sense of, of where they are. So she talks about co-creating conceptual frameworks. Um, guiding the connections between the material and the student experience uh, up front and uh, relevance, right? It's, it's, it's something that increases student motivation. It increases their confidence if they come in knowing that, hey, I know something about this or I've, I've, heard, I've heard of it before. Um, and, and of course, the, the, the student in engagement. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a pretty kind of standard thing where, where teachers will um, do a little bit of assessment. I'll talk about that in a minute. But yes, yeah, she does quote some research, which is nice, and connecting learning to experience and prior knowledge apparently increases achievement and increases student interest. More for those students who are perhaps less confident and less interested at the beginning than those that come in as the, the keeners and, and knowing a little bit, uh, little bit about it. So I thought that was really, really interesting. So in, in education, we, we call this whole step diagnostic assessment. It's the triumvirate of diagnostic, formative and summative. So it's the things you do at the beginning to get a sense, a benchmark of where you are, where the students are. Oftentimes teachers will come in with a clear plan and not really take a little bit of time to see, hey, what do my what do my students know about this anyway? She does speak about a pre-assessment process, and I put some question marks there. I'm a little dubious about that. Anytime I see pre-assessment or quizzing what students know at the very beginning, that would have to be done very, very carefully, right? I can't imagine the the emotional <laughs> trauma that would happen if a, if an instructor walked into the classroom and say, okay, you guys, let's see how little you know about this and we'll go from there. I've had instructors do that, best of intentions. Uh, no, no, this is not a test. It doesn't really count for anything. It just lets me know how little you know and where I need to start. So a terrible way to begin, but there are some really creative ways to, to get students talking and to uncover some of their common misconceptions or gaps. And you listen carefully, do some, do some little activities with students, get them talking about it and you can reveal that. And then she talks about some of those, right? Frameworks, partial notes, get students to fill in, little close activities, uh, concept maps. I, I like the idea of the partial notes uh, that students are, then they watch uh, a mini lecture or listen to a mini lecture, uh, watch a video, and then it's their responsibility to kind of fill in the blanks as they're listening. So they're a little more engaged in, in fleshing out the ideas as they as they go. So that was my my only kind of little bit of a, a red red flag when she talked about some you know quizzing or, or some kind of a formal assessment at the very beginning. But there are ways to do that. Uh, and it ties right in with last last week. I believe we talked about student responsibility for learning. She does a really nice job um, and just thinking about personal learning networks. I mean, we all have them. So I, I thought that was, I hadn't really thought about that before with so many opportunities through social media, uh, Twitter and connecting students uh, to, to the field, right? So they, they get a sense of, hey, who are the real people doing this work in the real world? And how can I kind of, you know, look over their shoulder and see the neat things they do? And they're just 
people will get up and put on their pants in the morning, like or your pajamas in the morning, like like we do, and you connect them and make it makes it more relevant. And this stuff is just not pie in the sky. We're in this classroom, these four walls doing all this conceptual abstract stuff that doesn't have any applicability to my life. So that I thought that was a great idea. So you can share your own, ask students to start creating theirs and where they would look to 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 create that. So I thought that was a really that was a really neat idea. So that was just some takeaways that uh, that I uh, that I had from the from the chapter, and certainly happy to uh, to talk a little bit more about what you guys thought. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks. That's a great uh, great overview there, Patrick. You wanna you wanna jump in here, Jeff? Anything you wanna you're jumping at the bit to to say? I got lots sure. of things to say. I, I mean, this this <laughs> got me reflecting on various things that I still think I do sort of um, poorly in my courses. Um, I mean, one of the things I do that sort of fits into all of this is um, is I get them to do reflective writing. And part of what I target in their reflective writing is getting them to uh, explicitly connect what they just saw in the lessons with things they've seen previously, right? So I'm 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 trying to get them to build these these uh, uh, webs of of uh, connections between the different ideas in the courses. Um, Concept maps are something I've sort of toyed with adding in, but they're, you know, again, yet another thing to add into my already very complicated courses. I like the idea of a close, I, uh, a close activity, right? The, 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 I hadn't thought of using, like I've only thought of using close in a quizzing capacity, but using it as a set of, um, uh, mostly constructed notes that they can then fill in the blanks on is 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 uh, a really good idea. It ought to be, um, I'll say in air quotes, easy to implement um, and wouldn't add a lot of uh, time to the students' uh, um, commitments in the course, which is part of why I, I, I'm at this stage sort of resistant to adding more things to my courses because my courses are already overloaded for the, from the students point of view, right? But I think I think those would work well. Yeah, I, I do. Uh, I do a number of these uh, in various uh, ways. Uh, so pen and paper, I've always resisted uh, the uh, in fact, I actively put up my PowerPoints after the lecture because I'm afraid students are going to print them. And my my PowerPoints are done old school the way you're supposed to use <laughs> slides, which are that they're almost all images or things that support me actually talking. They're not. There's very little text. And so if you print them, what you end up, and I also use black as a background. And so if you print them, you just kill your toner cartridge and you got 40 pages of just like black pictures. Oh, with Jesus. Anyways, it's a disaster. But I, I used to see people who would do this. They'd print their whole PowerPoints and bring them in uh, and then and then uh, and then annotate them like that. Uh, so I purposely don't do that because of the, the paper wastage. But I, I do do things like there's a uh, there's this fantastic video I found, which is a hour and a half long, but really engaging overview of essentially the history of uh, uh, the history of the planet. And so I, in my Earth history class, the first third of it is kind of uh, is kind of modern geomorphology and modern surface processes. And then we jump suddenly back four and a half billion years and we start looking at the evolution of the planet, applying those rules we just learned to how the planets evolved. And so before we do that, we watch this hour and a half long video. And so I give them a, a two page sheet uh, with questions and I don't have timing points within the, the movie. But there are questions distributed the whole thing where they have to just fill in the answers as they're going along. They pop up. And I found that works really well. It engages them, but also I get to pull out things. I can also use it to correct things as well, because there's a few errors. It's an older movie now, right? So every once in a while we get to a point and I'll have a line in there that says, they just said this, you know, but this is actually the thing, you know, or, you know, I have them, I have them just note an error in the, in the thing in, in the, in, uh, but the other thing is I, I do, uh, uh, they kind of fill in the blanks using again, and I know Jeff, I can't say it, they close, is it close? Close? Yeah, it's just close. close. So using the close see. format yeah. on, uh, you could write a block of text and then have drop down multiple yeah. choice things, right? 
So I do a lot where I'll have a whole passage of text and, you know, they watch a two minute video or something and then they come in and they have to fill in all the missing words in a, in a few paragraphs of text. Uh, just as a really quick one, one off kind of assignment going through and making sure that they understand those, the terminology and that, and that works really well. And it's a really simple thing to do in a digital context as well. Um, so have you guys tried pre-assessments? I have thoughts too, but I'm just, I'm just curious, like Peter, is your, uh, not Peter, how, <laughs> Patrick, is your, is your objection theoretical or is it based on, on experience? What is the... <laughs> Just, just being kind, right? It, it's, it's, you know, you, you could give a fun little quiz activity. You know, it, it all depends on how you approach it. But stu students are super sensitive to any sense that this is yeah. going to be an assessment. Or even if you're saying, "Don't worry about it. It's just a little quiz. Just tell me what you know." Uh, I've seen, I've seen students just blanch. You know, they think, "Oh my God, we're, we've just sat down here and this guy's giving us a quiz." <laughs> you know, so but you know, you can break them into groups. You can, you know, give them a few questions to discuss. You walk around the room and you, you kind of listen to what they're saying. You know, and and you pick up all kinds of of information about well, what what do they know about this topic starting out? You know, so that's very low stakes. So you can collect or, or just a discussion, some point questions and and some people will know some people will chime in you know so or it's dead silence you could probably read the room that way as well yeah, right yeah. so yeah so it's it, if it's done in a very low level low stakes way and and it's good to do you want to know where to begin you don't want to be boring people say oh yeah we did this two years ago in another course you know that kind of thing you might and you might get that feedback yeah no we know a lot about this we've done this in xyz or whatever so great idea just has to be handled uh, carefully, because some people see assessments, instructors, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. big yeah. test, right? The, uh, Darby doesn't deal with this as well as, I mean, the, the format of this book is different, but it, Lang, in his version of the book, uh, there, there, it's a lot longer, the, cha the chapters are maybe 30 pages, not a lot longer, but he has a portion in there of probably 10 pages, you know, getting into the actual psychological literature and stuff, and I remember this stuff from that book, and he gets it a fair bit more into experiments where they actually go and you know, expose people to a test before, and then it gets into that activating prior knowledge, identifying knowledge gaps, you know, creating kind of an internal stress where you don't know, and then you quickly provide the information, and then looking after the fact at the at the at the uh, impacts and retention. And apparently, it works. Uh, but I, I get what you're saying about the, uh, and it made me actually reflect a little bit more about whether I'm freaking students out because I do these kinds of things. But I try to do them, I mean, there's a lot of different ways, like you said, where you could do them where it's yeah. not an assessment. Like you could, it could be a no grades anonymous thing, for example, if right. it's online, where it just right. goes in and then you get real data that you can use to inform. But it can also be something at the beginning where you, they literally don't even hand it in. I've done that where I have them pull out a piece of paper and I'll say like, draw your best depiction of the, of the interior of the earth. And they have no idea. I do this. This is literally every time I teach what the structure yeah. of the interior of the earth looks like. Yeah. And they just draw a circle and maybe there's mushrooms <laughs> down there. I mean, it's not really, but it's just not, they have no idea. <laughs> they have no idea. And they look at me, right? And but, I don't have yeah. them hand it in. I don't know. I just have yeah, them hold no, on to it. Exactly. And then I teach it, but it's got them going, man, they're paying attention, right? Or have them, have them do it, write the answer down. And then I put them into peer groups take their answers together and collectively work on a better answer, right? Fantastic. And that's well, what that, they hand you, That's right? exactly the kinds of strategies you can use and no testing required, right? Yeah, but I see what you mean about the professor might just come in and suddenly just give them the, the exam right off the bat and they're, and they're gonna feel like they're horrible, especially if you don't immediately give them a chance to improve their performance. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So what I do um, is uh, I, I use, in my fall course, now I didn't do it this year because I didn't think I could do it um, online properly, but um, we use what's called uh, the force concepts inventory. It's a, uh, uh, it's a, well, I mean, concept inventories are sort of a, a standard thing, but I, so it's run at the start of the course and then again at the end. And it, contributes nothing to their mark and I tell them at the offset this is not testing you this is testing me <laughs> right because it's to see you know I expect that a lot of you will get very low marks on this at the start what I'm hoping is that you'll get much higher marks at the end and this gives me a way of seeing whether the course is working right but it does have the ancillary effect that they do this 
um, test at the beginning and and they see what their mark is on it. Um, uh, and, you know, so for a lot of them, that shows them how how much improvement is going to be needed. But no, I, I agree with you, Patrick, that that it has to be done very carefully. And, you know, uh, my my whole thing of telling them that this isn't testing you, it's testing me, um, I hope makes it better but um but yeah they can tuck it in their binder and say you know and then compare it after and say wow right. look at my growth in knowledge from the time yeah. we had that quiz at the beginning and now look at what i know you know yeah i mean that's so that's, then i mean the other thing that is sort of almost pre-testing is just the fact that and i i think of it this way again in the the online lessons where they're watching the videos and then answering questions in between the videos now it's not really pre-testing because they've just watched a video and now they're answering a question on it but you know a it doesn't count for marks in any way it's purely i the the, the lessons are the mark is for completion only and B, it's at the very beginning stage of their learning, right? The expectation is they're going to watch the video. They're going to ask answer these questions largely to see how much they're getting the ideas. And then they're still going to come to class and learn more and then go away and do the assignments and learn more, right? So it's right. How, how pre is pre, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I actually sort of think of those as pre-testing in part because they're so early in their learning process and in part because I do look and I see, well, you know, if I see that a lot of the students are getting, you know, 20 percent uh, on the questions in the lessons, then that tells me something, right? That tells me, you know, possibly that the lesson isn't working very well uh, or possibly something that in a few lessons I already know that it's a really tough topic. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Well, when they talk about the partial notes, just to share this and you know, the, the the vexing question for all instructors, you really want the student to read that chapter. It's a real gem of a chapter. There's great, great information in there. You have to read it before you come to class. And you know that they're just not going to slog through through that. So what I've done is is in the past, and it's a, a strategy you can use, something like the partial notes is graphic organizers. So so I, I do up a... Uh, uh, flow chart ideas circles you know maybe a Venn, and i'll put i'll put maybe a key theme or a key idea from you know first part of the chapter here's what i really want you to get in and maybe three or four bullet points you fill it you fill in the bullet points from your reading so they're doing the reading and they're kind of taking directed notes that i've kind of created here's what i want you to get from it but there's that little bit of a puzzle aspect and then they can bundle those together and, and pass them in at the end. They're graphic organizers for their reading. It's okay. kind of like a guided reading in a way, but it, it picks up on some of the ideas that she shares there. They start filling in the, the details and, and fleshing things out a little bit better, making connections by my guided arrows and bubbles and things like that. So that, that has worked well. They complain about it if there's too many, of course, but if you do hit the sweet spot, it, it works well. One hmm. of the things I do in my lessons, which is very basic, and I only started doing it this year, um, but at the very start of each lesson, there's just a quick little paragraph saying what the lesson is going to be about, and then they're supposed to uh, write three things that they think they already know about the topic, or three things they've seen previously in this topic, but know that they're confused about, right? Uh, now, I never look at them. It's purely for them to reflect, right? Um, uh, and, you know, I, I don't look at them just because I've got so much other marking <laughs> to do. I don't get to those. Um, but uh, but that is one thing I do. And I, I would like to look into whether it's having any measurable effect. But I'm not sure how to do that. So. Uh... Pro, the uh, the the personal learning networks. Uh, th this is an interesting one. So uh, I'll note first off what not to do, maybe because I've heard a lot <laughs> of complaints about this. Where you, sometimes they, you have these assignments where it's like contact the author of this paper or contact you know a scientist in this field and then get them to tell you something. 
And uh, the problem is there's like eight people in the world who are really public about this. And so like if the assignment's and on sharks, bombarded. there's the one shark guy who gets hit with a thousand emails a semester and he's like, stop sending your students to me, right? <laughs> so I, I want to be clear, that is don't do that. Don't just say randomly reach out to somebody and ask yeah. them, tell me stuff, right? If you have a directed question, that's one thing, and Don't, but don't do that. But I, I, I'm thinking a little bit, actually literally more personal. I'm thinking a couple of examples. So. I had uh, I had a assignment this last semester where I had students uh, use Google Earth to create guided tours of uh, of any geological spot they wanted in the world, and one of the, a couple of students did them on uh, Sydney's coal mines around Inverness and then around the Glace Bay area. And one of the the students said, um, uh, "Actually, my dad used to work in the mines. Would it be okay if I talked to him?" And I'm like, "Yes, right, absolutely. You do firsthand research, absolutely." Yeah. And so mixed in with all the actual academic research were these personal anecdotes and stories. And that was amazing. She's got this person sitting right next to her. And then I uh, frequently, and maybe you guys have had this experience as well, the little voices that come off camera when you're doing the online stuff, because someone's mom or someone's husband or someone's daughter is actually sitting right beside taking the lesson in. And sometimes I'll hear a little voice and it'll be correct, right? It'll anticipate <laughs> something I'm saying. And I was like, hey, who is that little voice? Uh, and they're like, oh, that was my husband. And I was like, bring him in, man. He's great. He knows exactly what he's talking about, right? Or that was my wife or whatever. There's one where uh, one of my students, their, uh, their mother is actually a geologist and is back doing a master's right now in, uh, in like petroleum geoscience. And she's in my petroleum uh, geology class, right? The, the, her daughter. And I'm like, you've got this amazing, this amazing uh, you know, resource right here. So uh, tying those in, those direct personal resources, but also there's an aspect I think there where you can, uh, you can, by acknowledging and endorsing the kinds of knowledge that are, uh, that are you know, parallel to formal academic knowledge, uh, but different, we can also you know, validate those other ways of knowing, but also validate often, especially students coming from blue collar backgrounds or indigenous backgrounds, we can we can validate and acknowledge the the knowledge that they're bringing in and that their culture might have about these kinds of things. You know that I might teach you some academic history about the coal mines, but your family lived through it, right? Yeah. And that might be something you actually feel some shame about, right? Because it's not you're not highfalutin like the like the guy with the PhD over here, but your knowledge is actually deeper and more valid than mine in many cases. Yeah. Yeah. So I that's, think that, that's a, good point. that a personal learning network that that acknowledges uh, those different forms of knowledge that often surround students, I think can also uh, also kind of you know democratize the learning, whatever, in addition to just being useful and tie in personal connections and that. Anyways, that's just a thought. No, no, that's great. I mean, it, it also hits on that interdisciplinarity, right? You know, you look at coal mines through a lot of different lenses and science is one and the geology, but then, you know, the history, the, 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 the cultural stories, the, all of those things really builds up, you know, the, the, the knowledge base for sure. Great. Idea. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, well, let's go. What, let's look at a couple of these, uh, a couple of these uh, final kind of, uh, of things here. Uh, what about uh, the idea of, uh, of using uh, of, of using online resources to kind of extend what what students are doing? Right? Do you guys do that where you encourage them to go and, you know, Google in real time or you know, take advantage of the smartphones in their pockets uh, rather than fight it? You guys, so, you guys actively certainly. That? So, I mean, for for example, one of the things that I'm constantly doing all through my first year courses is just getting them used to the fact that just numbers are stuff they can look up, right? So, you need the conductivity of copper. You'll want to know what the acceleration due to gravity is on the moon, whatever. All those things are just easily looked up as you need them, and so you absolutely should, including during class, right? Um, so, um, so I leverage that, um, uh, and I do say, you know, I, 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 I tell them explicitly. Partly, this is my my constant battle against memorization, right? I, I, I fight against memorization when I when I think my students are memorizing, I try to push them in other directions, right? And so, um, you know, if they just need an equation, I say, well, you know, hope, hopefully you've got it on your cheat sheet. But if you don't have it on your cheat sheet, pull your phone out and Google it. You'll probably come up with it. Just, you know, be careful because you'll find some wrong ones too, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about you, Pat? Do you? Do no, you that's do great. I and you know, I, even since this has been written, there's just so many. Like we talked about the video and 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 having notes and taking notes and and writing things. Uh, you know, you, you there's there's software now where you can actually post questions at a certain point. It pops up. Students can yeah, yeah. respond and all that kind of thing. And I'm trying to think of the, the program I used it. It was a part of a, a quick, quick little seminar we had, and it's a Google product, Google Jam or something. I can't remember the the little nifty name. Jamboard. Jamboard. That's it. Yeah, and and it it really kind of just uh, simulates that. You know, as we all do at conferences, you go around and you colored uh, sticky notes and the one group explores an idea and then you can bring them all together it's literally that and i said wow that, that has so many so many uses for making connections right and getting students to kind of work together uh in real time online right so i, I thought that was really neat and it's easy to set up you just open it up and way to go yeah nice all right well that brings us to the end of our time here uh so yeah that's it. If you guys have any any final thoughts or anything you want to throw in, you feel free to speak up. Good. No, it's great. Great chapter. Enjoyed it. Lots, lots of lots of things you think about them, but they just give you that that little other perspective to think about. You know, it. speaking yeah. of connections, uh, for me, one of the things anytime I read this, uh, a lot of these things I, I'm doing already, uh, or I've done as a one off. I walked into class and I just came up with it as a as a you know, epiphany. <laughs> And then, and then often I forget I did that. And reading through this, uh, you know, activating prior knowledge, right? Reading through yeah. this often, like, oh yeah, I did that that one day, and that worked. That's what and I was doing. The theoretical underpinning for it, right? Good for me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I might actually know what I'm doing. Yeah, but also, I just I, it forces me to. I, I often recall things that worked that I completely forgot. Like, oh, I better do that again. That actually worked yeah. great when I did that in yeah. class. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's actually all right. Good. Yeah. yeah, great. Okay, we'll see you guys. Uh, we'll see you guys on Tuesday. All right. Bye bye. Talk then.